Welcome to Highway 28. In addition to being a state highway that runs north and south through eastern Massachusetts, Highway 28 is a new public access program produced at the RCTV studios in Reading, Massachusetts. My name is Bruce Cooper and I will be your host. For episode one, I am showing a video by Swedish doctor Andreas Onfeld. He is known to many here in America by his website, www.dietdoctor.com. The USDA traditional food pyramid, adhered to by most doctors and dietitians, may not be as good for our health as we have been led to believe. There is growing evidence that a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet is healthier than the low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet that we have been used to since the 60s. Many people are discovering the benefits of a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet and ketogenic diets that limit the consumption of sugar and carbohydrates while increasing the consumption of healthy fats. Take a look at this graphic. Is this the direction we want to evolve as a species? I believe that Dr. Onfeld and others are teaching something important and useful to us all. So let's go to the video. Okay, the final talk in this session is by Andres Onfeld, strapping young man standing next to me, maybe not quite as strapping as um, Michelangelo's uh, David, but uh, still impressive nonetheless, who's going to be talking about the food revolution. Please welcome him. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Andreas Einfeld is my name. I'm a medical doctor from Sweden, so that explains the accent, if you were wondering. Um, I'm going to talk about the food revolution happening in Sweden right now. People eating real food and improving their health. And how perhaps the same thing might be happening in America soon. But uh, let's start with David here. The, uh, famous statue by Michelangelo. It's a masterpiece from the, from the Renaissance, 16th century Italy. But this is when David was living in Italy. Then he moved to the United States and uh, he started watching the Dr. Oz show on TV. And this is what happened. And it's not pretty, uh, but of course, David is not alone because obesity has quite recently become a huge problem in the entire Western world, including for many of my patients. And the question is, why and what can we do about it? I'm trying to do what I can. So I, I started a blog in, in Swedish uh, three years ago, and it's called Die Doctor in, in English. Um, and it's been an interesting journey because when this blog was just getting started, there were like 500 visits every day. So obviously there is a big interest in the subject of, of uh, food and health. Now a year later, there were about 5,000 visits every day. And this year it's up to 19,000 a day, which is quite a lot for a small country. So something big is happening in Sweden. And to understand what, we have to go back in time a few million years. So this is a basic view of human evolution, and there's only one point I want to make. This took millions of years. So it takes a long time to change our genes. But the modern obesity epidemic didn't take millions of years, as you know. It may have started slowly a long time ago, but the main part of it, most of it, has taken place in the last 27 years. And how is this even possible? Something must have changed in the environment. And what happened 27 years ago in 1984? Well, for example, a big campaign was launched to teach the American people to fear fat and cholesterol. And the idea was that food like eggs and bacon raised the cholesterol in your blood and thus it could give you heart disease. 
Now this was largely an unproven theory back in the 80s. So this campaign, you might say, was an experiment. And there were scientists back then who issued warnings saying that there may be unforeseen consequences from this, things we haven't thought of. And perhaps one such consequence we should have anticipated, and that is, if you eat less of one kind, one kind of food, you're going to have to eat more of something else, unless you want to be hungry all the time. And if you, if you eat less carbohydrate, if you eat less fat, you're going to have to eat more carbohydrates, such as bread and pasta and sugar. Now, all carbohydrates are digested to simple sugars in the gut, and when they are absorbed in the blood, raising the blood sugar, the body produces the hormone insulin, as you know, which is also the body's main fat storing hormone. So, ironically, this could happen. Eating less fat could give us more problems with obesity. Of course, some people are thinking, hold on, it's not quite this simple, because what about the Kitavans that Professor Lindeberg was speaking about? They ate a lot of root vegetables, which is carbohydrates, and they weren't fat. In fact, they were fit and healthy. And what about all the Asian people eating all that rice? There were no obesity epidemic traditionally in those countries. So, obviously you can get away with, it, with this. You can eat a large proportion of carbohydrates and not get fat. But, all of these uh, populations were eating unrefined starch, not white flour. And they weren't even eating any pure refined sugar or fructose mostly either. In the Western world, we, we didn't replace the fat only with root vegetables or brown rice. We replaced it with sugar frosted donuts, french fries, ice cream, white bread, soda and juice, for example. So this is rapidly digested carbs uh, that quickly raise the blood sugar, insulin goes up, and if you're sensitive, it can make you gain weight. Now this is, of course, still only theoretical. But now we know what happened when we tested this low-fat advice in an uncontrolled experiment, perhaps unethical experiment. This is official statistics over the obesity rates in the US back in 1985. How many have seen these statistics? Perhaps half the group. It's pretty spectacular, right? Um, this is the year after the campaign to fear fat was launched. And if you take a look at the states, the blue states have around 10% obesity in them. In the white states, there's not even any good data because obesity wasn't a massive problem back then. But let's take a look by moving ahead two years at a time. To 1987, 89, 91, 93, 95. You see something is happening rapidly in the dark blue states that weren't on the map at all just 10 years before. Now covers half the country. And what's that? That's 15% obesity, that's a massive increase already. 97, 99, 2001, 03, 05, 07, and last year. So this is crazy, right? The, the yellow states, that's over 20% obesity, that's double just a few short time ago. And the orange states, that, that's over 25% obesity. And the red states, over 30%. So the obesity epidemic is spreading like a cancer across the country. And obese Americans have become common in just a few decades, less than one generation. And kids are affected too, as well. So obviously, this isn't a genetic problem. This is something in the environment, and it started when we began to eat refined carbohydrates and sugars instead of fat. And it gets even worse because obesity is not just a cosmetic problem. 
It's uh, strongly associated with, with all kinds of Western diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease, and even cancer. And the traditional view is that obesity leads to these other conditions. But that's not necessarily true. It could just as well be true that the same thing that makes us fat makes us sick. Anyway, there's not even any sign of this obesity epidemic slowing down. It's just advancing every year in America. And uh, you might wonder, where is it going to end? And according to some researchers, if nothing happens, if the trend, line, trend lines continue, every American will be obese or overweight by the year 2048. Nobody will be normal anymore. And obviously, this is crazy. It's not okay. We have to do something about it. And perhaps we can learn something from where I come from, which is Sweden, a small country in Northern Europe. And there's about nine million Swedes, and they're known for at least three different things. The Pokerbaba, <laughs> the Nobel Prize, and finally, fad diets. This is the journal The Lancet. It's a very prestigious journal, and recently they published a, a paper called fad diets in Sweden of all places because they were horrified by the popularity of a diet called LCHF standing for low carb high fat and uh, it's uh, basically a low carb diet where you remove all sugar and starch such as bread and the goal is usually to lose weight and improve your health and the focus is on real food, like meat and fish and eggs and plenty of vegetables. And the difference between this and traditional paleo diets is it allows for high-fat dairy products as well, such as butter, cheese, and some heavy cream, although no milk or skim milk, because that's too much carbs. Um, perhaps the milk protein is, is a bad thing too in, in big amounts, but the question is, um, first of all, there's no restriction at all on saturated fat, which makes some people quite nervous. And then, um, we'll get to that, but we might also wonder, is this a fad or not? And we'll get to that too, after some perspective, because this is the sales of butter in Sweden, from uh, 1985 up to a few years ago. And you can see it's gone down to less than half because probably we've been getting uh, the same advice in, in Sweden to avoid fat, avoid saturated fat, mostly perhaps to avoid cardiovascular disease. But also the thinking has been that if you, if you remove this calorie dense food, you're gonna lose weight. Just one problem, it didn't work like that in America. And in Sweden, if you add the statistics for overweight and obesity, obesity, you can see that it didn't quite work in Sweden either. Because in the same time period, we've been getting more problems with obesity. Now, if you look at the, the right end of the butter sales, you can see it's actually increasing again now. And it's been going up even more in the last year. Also, interestingly, the obesity epidemic seems to have at least slowed down. And I believe it will be possible to reverse it. So what happened in the last few years here? Well, a lot of things. But there is one event that kind of made the media really interested in low-carb diets. And it started with this woman, a doctor called Annika Dahlqvist, a um, general practitioner. And uh, she had problems with her weight herself. She tried unsuccessfully to, to lose weight in different kinds of ways until she found a low-carb diet. And she lost her excess weight. And she improved 
her help. So she started giving the same kind of advice to her patients. And they lost weight and felt good. So she started a blog and got a lot of attention and ended up in the papers and on TV. And um, of course, not everybody was happy about this. So two dietitians actually notified the highest medical authority in Sweden, the National Board of Health and Welfare, because they felt that recommending obese patients and diabetics to eat fat was unacceptable. Of course, they thought that they were going to die. Now, the National Board of Health and Welfare, they quickly discovered that this was not quite easy to answer. Should they reprimand this doctor? Should they take away her medical license or not? They had to do an investigation and it took two years. And back in 2008, in January, they came with their conclusion. And they said that this is okay. The doctor can give advice to her patients to eat a low-carb diet with a lot of fat. Because, like they said in their conclusions, low-carb diets can today be seen as compatible with scientific evidence and best practice for losing weight. As a number of studies have shown an effect in the short term and no evidence of harm has emerged. And as you can imagine, yeah, it's nice, huh? As you can imagine, this really affected the debate because this ended up in all the papers and all the television channels. And uh, low carb had been called a dangerous fad diet. But now the highest medical authority in Sweden said the opposite, that it's proven to work and there's no known dangers. So this was a revolution in the debate. And it's been gaining popularity, this kind of eating, ever since. And now, according to a new survey, 23% of Swedes are trying to lower their carb intake, which is quite a lot, I would say. So, the question is, is it a fad? Or, I would like to ask, is this a fad? The diet the pyramid and the, the new multi-million dollar design, my plate. <laughs> which is all based on this old idea that fat raises the cholesterol in the blood and gives you heart disease. Now, does it? After half a century of research, we now have an answer from reviews of all the evidence. And the answer is no, it doesn't work. Avoiding saturated fat doesn't make you live any longer or save you from dying of a heart attack. In fact, if you look at all the observational data, there is not even an association, meaning that people who defy the advice and eat a lot of saturated fat, they don't get sicker than people who follow the advice and avoid it. So it doesn't work. And if you want to take a look at these reviews, you can find these studies with links to them at my English site, dietdoctor.com slash science. Some might may wonder, what about the cholesterol? Because it's true that avoiding fat and avoiding butter is going to lower your cholesterol. But the thing is, it turned out to be not quite so easy because it's the HDL that mostly goes down, the good cholesterol. And that's a bad thing. Also, you get smaller, denser LDL particles, which is also a bad thing. So it's not even good for your, your cholesterol. And in Sweden, a lot of authorities are starting to acknowledge this in public in the papers, such as uh, a professor called Göran Berglund said this in Sweden's biggest paper. Two generations of Swedes have been given bad dietary advice and have avoided fat for no reason. It's time to rewrite the dietary guidelines and base them on modern science. It's also pretty heavy when a guy like Professor Berglund says it because he's been doing this kind of research. Another example, another professor saying this, people have been recommending low-fat diets for 30 years and then it turns out to be completely wrong. There's no proven correlation between saturated fats 
and cardiovascular disease. And the third example, another professor, actually cardiovascular research, he said this, it's time to face the facts. There is no connection between saturated fats and cardiovascular disease. So, question is, who cares about this? Is it just academic discussions or does it have any practical you know, meaning? Well, the fear of cholesterol and saturated fats, that's the foundation of the last decades of dietary advice. And when, when the foundation falls, the entire low-fat advice falls. So, this is a fad, I would say, and it's time to, to uh, stop giving this advice. There might be a bit of a paradigm shift going on. You know, like uh, in science, in, in the 17th century, people believed that uh, the Earth was uh, the center of the universe and then found out that it wasn't quite like that. It was the opposite. We circled around the sun. And it, but it took quite a long time for the scientists to, to acknowledge this. So it takes some time. And that's the, the paradigm shift that I think is, is starting now. And uh, this is what's going to happen, I think. We used to think that saturated fat is bad, and now we're going to see that it's safe to eat. We used to think that carbohydrates are good. We might see that it can become a problem, that too much of it can make you fat and sick. And looking at the science of low carb is, is, uh, is interesting. I'm going to talk about two different things, for weight loss and for diabetes. Starting with weight loss, it's usually, many people are saying that it doesn't really matter what you eat, it's all about the calories. But it turns out, when you actually test this, it's not that simple. Because in studies, time after time, low carb turns out to give you more weight loss on average. This is after one year, and this is after two years statistically significantly more than low-fat advice. Well, the, the difference shrinks a bit, but then you have bad compliance at the end. So, and if you look at shorter trials where the compliance is still good, then uh, low-carb is destroying the competition with way more weight loss in study after study. In fact, if you look at all the randomized controlled trials where they found a statistically significant difference this is the result. There's 14 of them. What do you think it's going to be? How many for low carb? How many for low fat? It's actually 14 to zero. Low, carb, low fat hasn't won a single one. And if you want to see these studies, they're on my homepage as well. Um, but I find, the, I find this very um, disturbing because today, obese patients are still given the ineffective advice to avoid fat and calories. And what happens when the patients fail to lose weight using this bad advice? Do they get the more effective advice, you think? No. Instead, we conclude that they are lazy, hopeless gluttons, and we cut away their stomach to stop them from eating. So gastric bypass surgery is becoming one of the most common operations in the world. And I think we need a reality check very soon because these are healthy organs that we are removing. And uh, it's like trying to surgically adapt our bodies to the industrial food. How about first giving people some help to, to follow a more effective advice that might help them to lose weight, avoiding sugar and starch. This is a Norwegian friend of mine called Ronnie Mattison in Paris a few years ago. Since then, he's lost quite a lot of weight eating a low-carb, high-fat diet. And he made a movie using before and after pictures that he has allowed us to see. So this is before, and you can see something is happening. Now, Ronnie is eating all the food he wants, only avoiding sugar and starch. And you can see the fat melting away. Pretty interesting. You can see it from the side. 
the fat melting away with no voluntary calorie restriction, eating all the real food he wants. Now, we can do this in reverse, and it becomes a nice metaphor, I think, for a Western population eating more sugar and starch than they're adapted to handle. Take a look. This is what happened to America. Problem, too much sugar and starch, and the solution is to get rid of the sugars and the starches. And this is what happens. So I showed you a picture of Ronnie in Paris a few years ago. This is Ronnie in Paris last week. Looking good and feeling great. Now today, Ronnie is not in Paris anymore. He's in America, in Los Angeles, and he's sitting right over here. So if you want to have some tips on how to lose weight with no hunger, you can ask Ronnie. Or you can take a look at my page, dietdoctor.com slash LCHF for a totally free guide. Now, weight loss is not the whole story, because if you look at the, these weight loss trials, these uh, randomized controlled trials, an interesting pattern emerges. If you look at all the trials here, and you look at different factors like weight loss, you see the dark blue for a statistically significant advantage for low carb, lots of for weight loss, even for, for uh, uh, blood sugar, and for HDL cholesterol, for triglycerides, for blood pressure. Not a single study has shown an advantage for low fat. They're all pointing to an advantage for low carb. And these are, of course, as you know, this is the metabolic syndrome. This is obesity and diabetes. So, how about diabetes? You know what diabetes is. It's uh, too much sugar in your blood. Now, where does the sugar in the blood come from? Mainly from our diet, from the carbohydrates that are broken down to simple sugars in the gut. So, interesting, because this is a huge problem now. Um, 30 million diabetics in the 80s is on the way to half a billion in a few decades. It's an explosion. And even worse, the people who get diabetes are not expected to get well. They're expected to get a little bit more sick every year. And what kind of advice do we give them? Sick advice, perhaps? Because the bottom of the food pyramid, that's starchy foods, and that is the food that raises the blood sugar, because it's digested to glucose, and it gets into the bloodstream, and then it's blood glucose, right? Ironically, back a hundred years ago, people knew that diabetics were supposed to avoid carbs. This is a cookbook from 1917, and you can Google for the title, if you like, you can read it. Uh, this is page 12 and 13 that kind of sums it up. This is the foods that diabetics should avoid on the right side. Number one, sugar. Number two, starches, and then it's examples, flour, bread, biscuits, rice, macaroni, pasta. In fact, the title of the page is Foods Strictly Forbidden, which is now the base of the food pyramid. When we have an epidemic of diabetes, when the diabetics are getting sicker every year. Coincidence? I think not. Let's take a look at the left side, the good foods. That's fat, butter, and olive oil. All kinds of meat, all kinds of fish, all kinds of eggs. That was supposed to be good food for diabetics a hundred years ago. Well, guess what? It works beautifully for my patients today in Sweden. They all improve their blood sugar from eating like this, and usually lots of other things as well. I'd like to uh, talk about all the studies that have tested this and actually been showing some good results, but I don't have the time for it. You can find it on my webpage. Instead, I'm going to tell you how to prove this for yourself without reading a single study. This is food I ate last year, and it's a big piece of meat fried in butter. It's a 
vegetables fried in butter and it's uh, Bernays sauce. You know what that is? That's uh, butter and egg yolks. So it's a dietitian's nightmare. It's actually homemade, so I know what's in there. And this is huge amount of saturated fats and a lot of protein, but almost no carbohydrate, just a few grams. So what happens to my blood sugar when I eat this? I decided to test it. And uh, you know, uh, normal fasting glucose is perhaps between 72 and 108, and then it can get up after eating food. And this on the horizontal side is uh, time after eating up to six hours. So this is what happened. Wasn't a very exciting evening because <laughs> nothing happened. So if you don't eat any carbohydrates, you don't get any glucose going into your bloodstream and nothing happens to your blood sugar. It's not really rocket science. Um, interestingly, for a comparison, I went to the International Congress of Obesity, which is a huge conference for bariatric physicians and uh, obesity researchers. Once a year, about 10,000 of them go to the same place and they discuss the latest science when it comes to treating obesity. And that's, uh, last year it was in Stockholm, Sweden, so I went there, and that's where I ate the worst lunch I've had in years. Here's uh, some of it, and if you don't believe me, you can see International Congress of Obesity 2010 Stockholm, today's lunch. Yes, and uh, this is the way it looked like. There were no alternatives. This is what you got if you were going to eat. So it's sugar, and there's a lot of sugar in the yogurt. It's uh, 14 grams per 100 gram, which is a lot added sugar. And then we have sugar in the more natural package from the, from the fruit. And we have pure starch. Now, some of you may think that this sandwich contains something really fat and nice, you know, proteins and stuff. But that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, this is supposed to be a tuna sandwich, but I can tell you it's here somewhere and it's like a homeopathic dose. So it's not, it doesn't really count. I would say this is all sugar, all sugar and starch. And uh, just for comparison, this is the old meal and this is the new meal. You see? I was a bit shocked, actually, to see such a big increase. I think maybe I'm not quite used to eating a lot of carbs like this. But it, it went all the way up to 179 in an hour, and then it dropped quickly. So uh, after three hours, it's below fasting levels, which is also interesting because I was feeling hungry over the, uh, at that time, wanting to eat something I didn't. But uh, that's also interesting because eating this kind of food kind of often, I think, make you hungry after a while, and you eat more, and you gain weight. Anyway, this curve, this result, is still healthy, according to the guidelines. If I was diabetic, would have seen, it would have looked even worse. It might have shot off the slide. So which kind of diet do you think we should recommend to diabetics? Because this one is not allowed, according to dietitians. But I think this is what diabetics should eat. And uh, my patients eating food like that do great, in my experience. But that's not the kind of advice that they get from doctors and from dietitians today. This is a, a free brochure in Swedish. It says, uh, food for diabetics. And you can see there's a lot of fruit here. And I mean, paleo fans might uh, think uh, differently, but I, I think that's not the best kind of food for diabetics, at least, and I think many of you would agree. Um, but it gets kind of worse when you look in the brochure, because it says that foods that raise the blood sugar slowly is good. For example, fruit, rice, pasta, potatoes, and bread, which, as you remember, is exactly the kind of food that was strictly forbidden a hundred years ago, exactly the kind of food that ends up in the bloodstream as glucose and raises your blood sugar. And it even says so, that it raises the blood sugar. So, who gives out these free, uh, free brochures, you think? In this case, it's a drug company. 
which is kind of interesting because what do the drug companies sell? Medicines for lowering your blood sugar. And uh, when they give out free brochures that raise, with advice that raise the blood sugar, the patients are going to get sicker and they will need more medication and the drug companies are going to make more money. So I think this is a big problem and I think uh, we have a lot of problems in the society today. And the question I guess is this, how do we change this? It seems like it's a hard thing to do because there's a lot of interests, a lot of economic interests in this. It's not just, just the pharmaceutical companies, so the companies making the low-fat products, the food, and even the, the USDA, the, the US Department of Agriculture, are giving out uh, guidelines for every American. And I don't think the Department of Agriculture is going to stop recommending grains anytime soon. So, I don't think we're going to get change from these players. I think change will have to come from the bottom, from people like us. So how? Well, I mean, I'm a believer in a, in a viral kind of spreading of these ideas, meaning that if we have an idea, uh, a method that works well enough, and we get people to try it, and they feel better and lose weight, they're going to tell their friends, or their friends are going to ask them how they did it. And it's going to spread like a viral infection, but a good one. So that's the main thing, I think. And also, of course, we can use the media, and uh, why not new media like blogs, conferences like this, books, and uh, why not papers and uh, TV? Because the old media, they love stories about losing weight and gaining health by a diet change. So I, I think they're going to pick up on this, and I'm sure they're already doing that. Um, maybe we should think something about the message. I'm a big believer in the, the fact that I, I think that paleo, the paleo community and the low-carb community can learn a lot from each other and benefit from each other. So just my two cents about this. Uh, I think it's a good thing to focus on the health aspect. It's not just for weight loss, this is for health. And we have a lot of studies to show this. Also, like a lot of people are saying now, it's a good thing to focus on real food. And here, I think the low carb community has a lot to learn from paleo. Because there's a, lot, there's a big problem with low carb, especially in America, in my experience. Dream feeds pasta. And this is of course not the only problem, but it's a very good example of the problem. Because this is uh, marketed as a low-carb pasta. Only it's made from wheat, like any pasta. How is this possible? Well, they have a patent pending process, they say, for making the pasta, the, the, the wheat, undigestible. So, most of these carbs are going to be protected and they're going to pass through your system and only small amount of carbs are going to be absorbed. And this sounds too good to be true. In fact, I know it's too good to be true because I tested this pasta myself and it didn't work. Although, you don't have to take my word for it because this is such a good example because this has been tested by real scientists in a very nice journal called Diabetic Care. Actually, some low-carb researchers were surprised by this idea that you could eat pasta on a low-carb diet. So they wanted to get the data from the company to, to take a look, but they wouldn't give it out. So they had to test it themselves, and they used 10 volunteers who ate the Dreamfield pasta and regular pasta at different times, and they checked the blood sugar. Do you know what they found? They didn't find any difference whatsoever. Which is amazing to me. 
Corp fact, it says, I think it's not corp fact, I think it's corp fiction, I think it's a fairy tale for people who want to eat pasta on their low carb diets. Of course, they want to believe it. And there's lots of these uh, low carb fairy tales out there. Three quick examples. This is bread made from wheat flour, and it's called low carb bread. I'd say it's a high carb bread. Here we have um, uh, ice cream made from actually some real sugar and lots of sugar alcohols. I'd, th I'd say that's a high carb product. And even the Atkins company are disgracing themselves by selling Atkins <laughs> cookies. You know what the biggest ingredient in these cookies are? Can you guess? It's wheat flour. And another big ingredient is sugar alcohols. So it's basically all carbs. And this is a low carb company selling high carb cookies. Not good. I think we really have to focus on real foods like meat, fish, vegetables, and perhaps, if you dare, butter. <laughs> so, I think this kind of dieting really helps a lot of people to regain their health and eat good food, compared to the old advice that I think today mostly benefit corporations that make a lot of money from the status quo. Finally, I think it's good to focus on the fact that this is based on new science, science showing that it works, as opposed to the old science that said that um, low-fat diets would protect us from heart disease, only it didn't, didn't work. And here I think the paleo community can uh, benefit somewhat from the studies on low-carb, because like some of the lecturers said before, there is some nice trials on paleo diets, but they're pretty few, they're quite few and pretty small. So there's a lot more science when it comes to carb restrictions for, for um, weight loss and for diabetes. And uh, I think, uh, why not use that? And I think it's a good thing, like, like Rob Wolf said uh, um, yesterday, to not get religious about this, to not get dogmatic, but uh, try to continuously update our knowledge and improving and learning from each other and by making our idea as close to perfect as possible. If we do that, I don't think we need to fear this resistance to change. I don't think we need to fear it because like Victor Hugo said, all the forces in the world are not so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And with that said, I want to leave you with the story of Kenneth Jacobson. Now, Kenneth got type 2 diabetes early in life, in his 40s, and he gained a lot of weight. He weighed uh, 250 pounds. And uh, he got heart disease, he got heart attack after heart attack, until he had seven of them. He needed a coronary bypass surgery to get new vessels to bring oxygen to his heart. And he needed 12 drugs every day just to control his risk factors. He was in chronic pain. He was feeling tired all the time. And life was becoming pretty miserable. Until one day, a little more than a year ago, when he went to the store to get food. And for some reason, he started talking to a guy he didn't know there by the dairy counter. And they started to talk about butter. And this man told Kenneth that he and his wife had been eating LCHF, low carb, high fat, for a while, and lost a lot of weight. They felt great. And even more interesting, his wife had gotten rid of her diabetes. So, Kenneth was intrigued by this. He got an address for the internet, and he went home to read the same night. And the next day, he started to eat real food, except no sugar and no starch. Now, a little more than a year later, Kenneth, he doesn't weigh 250 pounds anymore, he, he weighs 185. He doesn't need 12 drugs a day, he's down to one. And uh, when he went to the doctor early this summer to get a checkup, he had normal blood pressure, he had a good cholesterol profile, and he had a normal blood sugar with no medication. So his values were perfect. And now he enjoys his biggest interest in life. He rides his motorcycle again. 
Now, as a doctor, in my practice, I see similar cases all the time. And this is important because across the world, millions of people, if not hundreds of millions of people, like Kenneth, could start eating real food and improving their health. The good news is, I think, that soon they will do that. I believe it because the evidence is here now. The paradigm shift is coming. And people like us can make it happen. So we can change the world. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed and will benefit from this video. My thanks to Dr. Onfeld for his permission to broadcast the food revolution. Also, my thanks to the RCTV staff for their help. Until next time, I'm Bruce Cooper.